What's going on, y'all? It's Javon.ca, and we're here again for another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K, where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand in a month. And today, I'm very excited to introduce you to someone who started as a wrestler and then went through a crazy roller coaster to now running an insurance and finance business in two different countries. Are we two different countries? Are we more than that? We're in two countries right now, and we just expanded to Puerto Rico as well, which is Oof. part of the U.S., um, but we're, we're just getting warmed up now. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm I'm very excited to introduce you to none other than Jamie Prickett. Now, look, it's interesting when you talk about making 100 grand in a month for yourself. But what if you could teach others to do that for you? Now, today we're going to dive into the story of none other than our friend Jamie Prickett. Jamie, thank you so much for taking the time with us. Awesome, today. man. It's a pleasure. I'm pumped up about this. Yeah, man. It's is a, it's been a long time coming. I'm very excited that you're yeah. taking the time to spend with us today. So yeah. I'm really excited to dive into your story and learn a little bit more about you. But let's start with kind of some of those you know, milestones and circumstances and things that happen in your life that really make up Jamie Prickett today. Maybe you could share. Yeah, for sure. Um, basically, one of the pivotal moments in my life, I think, was in, in high school. Um, I was a wrestler. I wasn't very good in high school. Um, I managed to get out after five years to finish my four year high school degree. Um, so, you know, I joke that I have my Ph.D., which is a public high school diploma. <clears throat> and then uh, Anyway, through high school, the one thing I cared about was wrestling. That was my life. Um, you know, it was my dream to be an Olympian. I had my career path already set out in front of me um, because there was a guy named Daniel, Neg uh, Daniel, uh, well, I'm going to mess up the name, Daniel Agali. Sorry. Uh, Daniel Agali was an Olympic gold medalist uh, when I was in high school. And he actually got on the Cheerios box. So they had his mug on Cheerios. And then I heard it through the grapevine that he got a million dollar endorsement. And I'm like a million dollars. I could retire on that. So my plan was very clear. I'm going to wrestle. I'm going to go to the Olympics. I'm going to win the Olympics. I'm going to be on a Cheerios box and I'm going to retire on my million dollars. Well, I got to number five in Canada, not quite enough to get to the Olympics and clearly didn't win a gold at the Olympics. So I had to take a different route. Um, well, hold on. The most important question is, did you ever make it on the Cheerios box? Did not. No, <laughs> did Damn not. It. Failure. Um, so uh, that was that was kind of I didn't really have a backup plan, to yeah. be honest with you. I really didn't care much for school. Um, you know, I, I learned by doing, not by being told what to do. Um, I'm kind of a take action kind of guy. And it's one of my beefs with the whole public school system and the school system in general is that it's kind of designed, I think, for people to learn a certain way, mm -hmm. but people learn differently. Right. And now we think when young boys are bouncing off the walls and, you know, and they're they're banging their head against things, we think, oh, they must have an issue. They must have a problem. No, they're, they're seven year old boys that are full of energy and they just want to run around and yeah. chase people. Right. Yeah. Um, so I was one of those boys. And anyway, but what wrestling taught me was m the most important thing it taught me was failure. Um, you know, I, I won more matches than I lost. Mm. But every time you lost a match, um, you had to swallow your pride and realize that the, the man across from you was better than you that day. And, you know, you just had to you just had to suck it up and. And it took me a while. I mean, I used to be a bit of a sore loser. I wouldn't, you know, cry in front of anybody, but I would certainly go home and cry. And I, you know, punch my fist against the wall and I'd be upset and angry and a bit of a temper tantrum. Um, but I'd always do that on my own. But over time, I recognized that I can't beat someone else. I can only beat myself. You know what I mean? Like I can only improve myself. I can't choose how good someone else is going to be that I'm up against, but I can choose how good I'm going to be. So I started taking personal responsibility for everything bad and good that happened in my life. Now, so what what changed at that point? Because if you're being a, if you're being a sore loser, right, and you're just upset mm -hmm. and throwing punches at the wall, right, like all of a sudden you don't just go and start blaming yourself. Like you no. must have consumed something. You must have heard something. You well, must have learned something. When I went on to uh, train at the University of Guelph, I didn't go to university, but I trained with the guys there at the club program they have. Um, the head coach there, Dave uh, or uh, Doug Cox, he's a two-time Olympian. Also Dave Mayer, who was kind of a, a guy about my size. Um, they just they just spoke life into me. Um, you know that you know get off the get off the mat you know if I was sucking wind at, the, at a practice get off the mat get up you know and uh, they were tough uh, Dave Mayer was the tough coach Doug Cox was the loving coach mm. and it was that combination mm. um, but even before that time I remember when I got second in high school at the uh, national championships I was number two in Canada and I was probably only ranked maybe top six and I came home from New Brunswick and this is before cell phones and I came home from New Brunswick and told my parents my mom and dad were there and I said, hey, I got the silver medal. 
And the first thing out of my dad's mouth was, I guess the other guy wanted it more. And that was hard. I mean, he, my, my dad was a bit of a hard ass. Now me and my dad have a great relationship now, but at the time I was like, you know, screw you, dad. You Probably know, pissed. That, oh, I mean, I was like, I just got the silver freaking medal in Canada. Yeah. I wasn't even expected to be on the podium. And here I was, you know, doing something. And, but it kind of hits me, you know, years later, it's like, he was right. Yeah. You know, I could have done a little bit more. Now, maybe I never would have got the gold. Maybe that guy was always, his name was Fred. Maybe Fred was always going to beat me that day, but I, I'll never know because I know that there was more in the gas tank. I mm. could have trained a little harder. I could have been getting up a little bit earlier and putting in another workout, you know? Oh. Um, so maybe there was some truth to it, right? And that's what I recognize in the business world now. What I love about the business world is it's not about natural ability and talent. Um, sure, someone's gonna be a little more talented in one area than, than someone else might be in another. But at the end of the day, it's who's gonna bust their ass? Who's gonna go out and get after this thing? I am far less talented than most of the people whose asses I'm kicking right now. Mm -hmm. I just work harder. Yeah, and that is something that's super interesting, especially when it comes to winning and losing, because sometimes you win, but deep down you still know you didn't give it all. Yeah. And and like, although other people might say, oh, look, at you, you did this thing, it was so great. But deep down you're going back home, still punching the wall because yeah. like, you know, you could have left more on the field. Yep. Right. And yep. sometimes when you when you lose, but you've given it your all, it feels better than even when you win. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I remember I went back to wrestle when I was 34 years old. Um, this you, is actually you still got it, or I still had it. Yeah, okay. it's like riding a bike. <laughs> the the difference is that I hadn't I hadn't really competed in 13 years, and it was always a dream of mine. And this was right when we launched our company, so mm. we were one year into building Xperia, and I decided I'm going to go back and wrestle, give it one more shot. And I had it in my mind that you know I'm going to I'm going <laughs> to medal at the nationals and maybe i'll go two years and i'll be in the olympics like i had it in my mind okay. and at 34 years of Finally, age that cheerios box it's coming that's right right yeah <laughs> even though now it's like i don't need the cheerios box but i was like i was still chasing that dream and it was because it was one of those regrets i left wrestling at a young age i was 21 when i basically hung up mm -hmm. my boots and mm -hmm. and i was kind of pissed off about that because yeah. my plan was always to go back and I just wanted to get my business off the ground with my former company when I mm -hmm. got into the insurance world and mm -hmm. it just never happened for me. It took me a decade of struggle in there before I started really doing some things outside of that. Wow. Um, but anyway, I, uh, I decided to go back and wrestle and I remember my first tournament back, first tournament back was at the Toronto Open and I won three matches and then I lost in the final. I got a silver medal. And I was up a couple weight classes still because I hadn't got down to my weight class. I was still a little bit chubby and trying to lose the weight. Um, the next tournament, or sorry, I should say the last time I wrestled another tournament, did okay, had a national champion. My second match did okay, lost to him. It was close, but I was still getting back into it. Yeah. But then my last tournament, and this is where I decided I'm hanging up the boots for good. I gave this, I mean, I, I trained harder those five months back into wrestling than I ever did as a 21 year old when mm, I wrestled. That must have I, felt nice though. It did, I gave it everything I had and my body was sore. I cut 20 pounds in five days to make weight. Um, and your body doesn't cut weight the same way it does when you're young, so you're more exhausted the next day. But I remember I wrestled this guy named Omer and he was training out of Hamilton. And Omer was a junior national champion. And what that means is he's 19 years old. Mm. I'm like, I'm a 19 year old. 19, I'm gonna dust 19, this I'm, kid. I'm yeah. 34 years old. I trained till I was 21, took a hiatus, and my mindset and every I'm going against a kid. Of course. I mean, now, like I had children that were in their teens. Like, uh -huh. You're like, this guy beat my ass. Damn. Omer beat my ass. Um, Humbly. You know, now it didn't look like he beat my ass because my uncle Dave was in the in in the you know he was watching the tournament. He goes, I don't know what those refs were seeing. I thought you won that match. I'm like, no, Uncle Dave, uh, I got my ass kicked. I mean, yeah. And after that match, after I got my ass kicked, I didn't cry. I didn't punch a wall. I didn't get mad. I walked off going, Jamie, you gave this thing everything you had as a 34 year old man going yeah. against these young guys. And yeah, you don't have what it what it took to win. And you're probably never gonna at this age, the sport has evolved, the, the, the wrestlers are getting better and better, just like the UFC's evolved, right? Mm -hmm. Basketball's evolved. Players are getting better and better with time and nutrition and everything else. Mm -hmm. But I walked off going, I'm a freaking winner. Oh yeah. I lost that match, but I won. You know, yeah, I yeah. won. I won that game. So Dude, listen, to do that at 34, like I'm 31 and I'm starting to get some aches and pains. Oh, geez, come on. So the fact, <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. And a bunch of the people in my world too, they're like, oh my goodness, man. Like I'm feeling it right now. Yeah. And yeah. that to me is inspiring. It's like, yeah, you, yeah, you could be mid thirties and still do your thing. Yeah. I, I recently picked up tennis Oh, nice. uh, because I want to play some sports that I could play till I'm 70. Yeah. Right. And you yeah. see the old guys playing tennis and yeah. it's like, okay, cool. Like this is the next 
leg for me, the next leg of the race. So before you go into that whole 34 year old experience, right? You were 21 when you first hung up the boots. Yeah. What made you stop at that point? So I, it, this is me. I was, I was literally brainwashed by the insurance organization I was recruited to. No way. Um, I got recruited to this uh, network marketing style model mm -hmm. uh, where it was, you know, Hey, come work with us for a year and you're going to make six figures and beyond and chase your dreams and live the dream and everything else. And there was people that started in that company in the seventies and eighties, maybe in the nineties that did that. I think I was just a little too late to the ball game. It was kind of okay. saturated. The name of the company wasn't so great. Um, mm -hmm. I joined that company at 21 years of age. I quit my full-time job. Wow. I was already married, had my first child at this age, wow. um, already owned a house. Um, you know, this is when houses were a little bit cheaper than they are today. Yeah. I feel bad for the 21 year olds today. <laughs> um, crap. I feel bad for the 41 year olds today. I mean, it's, it's tough out there, but hey man, you got to hey, listen, you just got to boot up and wrestle as hard as you can. And it'll, it'll happen as long as you don't quit. Right? Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. But, um, but anyways, I, I joined this company at 21 years of age and I still wrestled for about six months after joining that company. But I realized really quickly that a lot of my appointments had to be in the evenings and that's when all the training classes were. So I decided I'm going to take a one year hiatus from wrestling mm -hmm. because then I can come back and go full time wrestling. I could okay. train morning, noon and night. Mm -hmm. And I took that one year hiatus because I'm going to give it all to the business. Mm -hmm. I'm going to basically retire from that company. After one year, I thought I'd be all set up. I'd never have to work again because that was Done. the dream. Millionaire. And I ended up making 13,000 my first year full time. Um, 13,000 in, in a month or the year? In the year. Okay. I lost both my houses that wow. same, that, that, that year I had, cause I had a rental property and, and I was just a high school, I was just a high school guy that worked in a factory. I had two houses. Now combined value of both houses was about 250,000. So it wasn't like big deal, but one was a rental and one was the one that I was living in with my ex wife now yeah. um, and our child. And I'll tell you, I lost all that, um, you know, just wow. chasing that dream. And I did manage to hit some certain accolades at that company. I ended up making six figures, um, you know, for the first time when I was 25 years old, I crossed okay. over a hundred thousand in income. Nice. Um, but I was still struggling financially because, you know, fast forward, um, met my, my now wife, Mm -hmm. in that company as well, uh, mm -hmm. about five years into it. Mm -hmm. uh, we started working the business together. We were still making about 100,000 combined income. Wow. We have four kids wow. I mean, we had an office to pay for. So we were really still struggling, you know, yeah. financially. Um, that's kind of where we're at. Wow, so this is, this is at 25. So now 25 to that time when you started Xperia and then got into boxing, what kind of happened there? into wrestling. Um, no, what happened was I, I left that company after 10 years. So okay. I was, thir I was your age. I was 31, 31. years old when I wow. quit that company. Okay. And at 31 years of age, I had a negative net worth. Wow. So I, I wasn't like, you know, had a little bit of money in savings and my TFSA yeah. RSP. I did not have an RSP. I didn't have a TFSA. I didn't even think they had TFSAs back then, did they? Sure. I don't mean to uh, date you. I don't mean to date you. I think no, they did. I think they had. I think they did. I'm not sure how many yeah, years it's yeah. been now. But okay. All right. <laughs> we're for, talking. We're talking 2011. So okay. it depends if I okay. can't remember what year the I think it, started. I think it can't. Anyways, that's you. Side story. Yeah, we, yeah. Someone can Google that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but anyways, um, I'm 31 years old. Okay. I've got four kids. Um, negative net worth. Negative net worth. And you I, just like, given up with the last company at this so point? So I gave up with that company and I didn't know what I was going to do. Wow. Um, I quit mm -hmm. that. I, I actually quit. I think it was September, early September. I called up my upline at that company. I said, John, listen, I'm no, done. I'm done. And he's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. And that actually was a decent month for me because mm -hmm. I was already making uh, that month. I ended up making about 13,000 that month, which nice. was like a higher than normal month yeah. uh, for me. And I told him I quit. And uh, he's like, what do you mean you quit? And I said, I quit. Um, my wife and I were looking at this other network marketing company, which turned out to be a mistake as well. But we were just, I was so frustrated. I was spinning yeah. my wheels. I didn't know what I wanted to do. Wow. And there was a part of me, because I had a guy quit the business uh, that, that was working with me years earlier no in way. that company. And he's now selling cars and he's doing good. Yeah. And I'm sitting there going, maybe I'll just breaking. sell cars or something. Like I didn't know what I was going to do. And it was uh, within two months, I had a guy approach me on Facebook who was also with the same company I was with for 18 years. And he says, hey, Jamie, you still with XYZ company? And I said, yeah, kind of. I, I'm part time and I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with the rest of my life kind of mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. He's like, well, come talk to me. I want to show you why I left. I'm like, oh, really? Wow. And he was there 18 years. So I listened to him and changed my life. Um, got became independent, uh, actually owned what I was building. Yeah. Tripled my income overnight. Wow. Bought, bought our first home, my wife and I together. No uh, way. My, my now wife, Leanne, who've been together for 14 years. Okay. Um, so we bought a home. Um, it was amazing. 
started making some money and then I got bored. And I got bored meaning I miss the environment. I miss the camaraderie. I miss mm. going to an office where there was people. Mm. When you're an independent agent, it's kind of a lonely world. You're just kind of sitting there at home until you have an appointment and then you drive to a client's home and then you drive back home. And, yeah. You know, it's like no one's there to high five you. I mean, Leanne would high five me, you know, but you know, I want the team and the environment. Yeah, I, want, yeah. I want some chest bumps and yeah. what's up? You know, yeah. hey man, we just did that deal. But um, anyways, so my wife and I put our heads together, prayed about it and said, why don't we build something? And that's what we did. We, we did it. Um, we said, let's start this company. And in uh, January of 2014, okay. Xperia was born. Uh, there was me and seven people sitting around a boardroom table, which was actually one of those plastic fold up tables with fold up chairs around it. Hey, listen, mm -hmm. if it looks like a boardroom and smells like a boardroom, it's a boardroom, all right? Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> Um, I, and, I wonder if it actually smelled like a boardroom or it smelled like something yeah. else, but whatever. Yeah, it was uh, it was on the second floor of a flower shop downtown Guelph. It was okay. about 300 square feet. Wow. It was brutal. Okay. Um, but we told those seven people, I looked around and I said, guys, we're going to change the world. We're going to do something big. Okay. Um, you know, and they probably all thought I was crazy, but uh, those seven have turned into almost 4,200 licensed agents as, wow. of, as of today. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. So before we just skip from chapter one to chapter I mean, maybe it's like chapter five right now because yeah. there's so much more to oh, go. Oh, sure. But I want to go back to those very early days, right? So you you were doing a different type of insurance prior to Xperia? Yeah, same insurance. Same insurance. Uh, still selling life insurance. Okay. Um, I was limited though. It was a captive company. I okay. only had one product I could sell. Okay. Um, the compensation was terrible. I didn't know that. Um, yeah. I was kind of brainwashed for 10 years, thought they were the best. I would. They. Everyone said they were the best. The speakers on stage said they were the best. Mm -hmm. uh, turns out it was... You know, hey man, a you lot of lies. You don't know what you don't know. No. And, and you can't fault them because they might have believed it too, right? I believe that. I believe a lot of the, I think there's a lot of great people that work there. Yeah. yeah. So how did you transition to now starting your own thing? Like, um, and, and what was that process like? Because it, it probably just didn't happen all of a sudden, right? No. It must have been a gradual kind of adjustment and feeling and change of mindset. Yeah. Um, what was that like uh, at the beginning? It's hard to say. Um, when we started, like when I left that company, I was mm -hmm. just selling. So I okay. wasn't recruiting anyone. I wasn't building an agency or a team. Yeah. I was just selling. You were just uh, a star player, the number one it. wrestler. That's it. Okay. You know, it was just me going out there, helping families the way I'd always done, except more tools, better compensation. Okay. Um, you know, it was just better all around that way. Um, then we found out that you can build something called an AGA, which is under an MGA. An MGA is like the AGA? big- AGA? AGA, Associate okay. General Agency. Okay. And the Associate General Agency falls under a Managing General Agency. Okay. A Managing General Agency, and you probably, you know, you'll hear companies like Manulife, Sun Life, um, Equitable Life, Empire Life, Beneva, you name these insurance companies. In order to buy their products, you typically will have to go through an agent who works for an AGA or an MGA. Okay. Because the MGA has the relationships directly with those insurance companies and there's certain volume requirements, compliance criteria, Got stuff it. like that. In order for this MGA to be able to allow agents and AGAs to distribute their products. Okay. Understood. So we actually found out uh, within a few months of being independent selling insurance that we could be an AGA, yeah. which meant we could go under an MGA. They give us a little bit more skin in the game mm -hmm. and then we could hire some agents. Mm. But that still didn't solve a problem for me, which was how do I give those agents the same opportunity as me who became an AGA? And why was that the problem for you? To like, me, it was a problem because it wasn't equal opportunity. Okay. Like who am I to say that I'm better than you, mm. but I'm going to recruit you to my company, but you can never have my position. Understood. I just didn't, I didn't like that. Yeah. Right. I, I always felt like, and that's the one thing I liked about the company I came from. That was one of the positives okay. is that, I was an RVP mm -hmm. and so was my upline. Okay. We actually had the same contract. Okay. Now he was there longer, built a bigger business. He, he was there, now he's been there for, geez, I think he's been there for 35 years now. Wow. Right? But but he was ahead of me kind of on the totem pole. He yeah. recruited me and I was under him and recruiting some people. And he was there longer than I was, but it was an equal opportunity in the sense that we could get the same contract. I had the same okay. contract as my upline, John. Got it. I liked that concept, yeah. right? I thought it was fair. Yeah, because um, it's based on the work that you put in. That's right. And, and, and it's not that I couldn't have passed him an income. Mm. It was highly unlikely. He had a big mm. business and everything, but it's possible, right? And I like that. So when we started, um, you know, looking at this AGA, MGA relationship, okay. we knew we couldn't be an MGA because I mean, crap compliance. I mean, I can't even, you know, I can't afford a part-time staff, let alone a full-time compliance officer. I mean, not, yet. Cost you, not, not yet at the time, right? Okay. So that's the MGA. So then we decided, well, well, let's be an AGA. 
So we did that. We started an AGA. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was actually called Empirical Group. That was our first baby. Six months after leaving my first company, we started Empirical Group. Yeah, okay. Um, Anyways, after starting Empirical Group, six months later, we had 25 licensed agents, which was huge for us. Of course. Like Wait, we, you go from how many to 25? I was at I was at my first company for 10 years and had 27 licensed agents. Okay. In six months, I already had 25. Wow. Right. And they weren't coming from my old team either. These were like new, new net people. new, net new. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, like we felt like, man, we're winning. Like, and we're still making good money because I'm mm-hmm. still selling. Anyways, we went from those 25 agents, and then I get approached by these guys with a company called Provincial Capital. Okay. Provincial Capital had an agency of about 10 agents, yeah. but they claimed they were bigger. They talked a big game and they were like a lot older than me. Mm-hmm. And I trusted what they said. They approached my wife and I and said, hey, we're an MGA. Here we are, we're just AGAs, mm. but we're an MGA. Why don't you come work with us? Why don't we build a business together? We ended up discussing it and we ended up giving them 75% ownership of our company. Wow. We kept 25%, but it was because they were an MGA. Now. Mm. Fast forward a little bit, like a couple months, we realized it was a little bit of games bit played of because first of all, they didn't have the 10 agents they said. I think they had two agents that were producing. Okay. Um, they also did have an MGA, but it was only with one company, but that opened the door for us. And I think that, huh. and I, I'm a big believer that God will use all things to bring about good for those who love and serve them. Wow. I, I truly believe that. Um, I don't, I'm not one of these guys. And my wife says this sometimes because she'll correct people. I've heard her do it recently where someone says, oh, you know, God lets bad things happen to you. And my wife's like, no, 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 no. God will, God will um, use things that might have happened to you that were bad. But it wasn't because of God that it happened, but he'll use those things to bring about good. Mm-hmm. So anyway, we kind of felt like um, looking back that if we hadn't have got into that relationship and gave up 75% of our company, we might not have really started to understand the MGA world the way we did. Yeah. So there was a lot of silver linings in that whole process. Yeah. Anyways, fast forward, um, 18 months of working with those guys. We're now into December of 2013, Okay. one month before launching Xperior. And I went into a manager's meeting with uh, the three guys and my wife and uh, the other guy's wife. And I basically told them I want my company back. Mm -hmm. And now we had like 75 agents and we were doing some big things. And my wife and I were single-handedly building that whole business on our own. Okay. Uh, We now had five MGA contracts because of all the volume that we were doing. And we said, we want our company back. And they said, that's not how it works. The company's not yours anymore. Interesting. Which is true because they own 75%. They offered me a buyout, which was a joke. So like any other good entrepreneur, I didn't take a buyout and a Mm non-compete. I went behind their back and started a company called Xperior. Okay. And then I went, surprise, I'm leaving you guys one day. Yeah. So, and that was it. So then you just started an AGA with a new understanding of the MGA type of we actually thing, were able are you to, an MGA now? We were able to start an MGA right away because we'd already built the relationship, got to the point where we had five MGA contracts. Okay. Two of those companies that we were with immediately granted us an MGA contract. Okay. And then we've built now to the point where we've got MGA contracts with almost all the insurers in Canada. Wow. Yeah. So just like like the power of relationships, man, yeah. goes a crazy long way. Yeah, it was huge. And that's that's really cool to see. Like you, you got into this deal and yeah, sure. Although it wasn't necessarily the best um, situation after after you learn more information, right? You still used it um, to your advantage. You yeah. still gained a lot of valuable lessons. Still yeah. gained gained a lot of valuable experience. Yeah. And like your wife says, right? They're, it's not going to throw anything bad at you, but it's going to give you a little construction construction yeah. zone, little detours yeah. to help you along the way. Yeah. So, for sure. do you remember the first time you made a hundred grand in a year with Xperia? Not really, because I mean, I was already making probably 300 before we started Xperior, okay. um, just on my own pen. So, yeah. I mean, probably within four months, I mean, cause we were already making that kind of money yeah. before we started it. Okay. Um, and that was only two years of us making money cause Congrats. my first company was 10 years. Mm-hmm. Then we started making about, I think we made 300 the next couple of years. Mm-hmm. And then Xperior, we probably made about the same, probably three, 400 the first few years. Yeah. Um, we weren't taking much out of the company. We were mm-hmm. still personally producing because, you know, we had to start building staff. We had to open a nice head office. Yeah. Um, you know, we had to start investing in the business. So I was still personally producing for about the first five years that we were building the company. Okay. I was still out making money just helping clients on my own. Wow. Um, it's only been the last five years where really I've had to step away from clients altogether other than I'll service the odd client if they need help with something or whatever. Yeah. Um, I've passed some of my clients along to other up and coming agents that they could service them just 
because we don't have the time to, we obviously we're running a big business now. hundred percent. Um, but so, no, I, I couldn't tell you like, I mean, the hundred thousand, I could tell you the first time I made a hundred thousand with my first company, mm. um, even though we were still broke, it was, it was probably a, way more meaningful. At it that was time. so <laughs> meaningful. It was a big milestone. And yeah. they gave you this big six figure ring, like this big, uh, yeah. they call it the six figure ring club. And, uh, I, I remember the minute, I remember the moment that I was looking on the system when we crossed over a hundred thousand, I remember the feeling. And, uh, that same month I paid off a credit card balance Oof. that I'd had forever. It wow. was a $2,500 credit card. I Oof. still have that credit card with the same limit capital nice. one baby. Nice. Um, and, uh, it, I almost just have it just as a monumental thing. I just keep you're doing it. it every year. Just keep it's, it on the wall. Yeah. It's like, it's one of those things. Um, that was an emotional time and I teared up and it was like, man, yeah. I did it even though I was still struggling, but it was one of those milestone moments for me. Yeah. Know, that hundred percent, man. Thank you for sharing. You know, it's, it's cool seeing the smiles as you recollect some of these memories, right? Yeah. Because like they mean so much, yeah. you know, and it's cool to see where it is now. So I remember I, I was in the video business and <clears throat> it took me three years, two and a half years to cross the hundred K mark. Right. Yeah. And then I took two years off, uh, did some real estate activities, learned a ton, got back into it. And it's like, you get to the same mark way faster yep. your second time around you know yep. and and there's still so much more to go yep. and it's exciting looking forward and seeing all the all the roads still left in the journey you know it's almost yep. like your gps still says yeah there's 36 more hours till we get to this destination yep. so i'm gonna look at it and be like oh 36 hours but i'm like oh 36 hours i wonder what type of things are going to see on the way yeah so yep. it's really exciting and inspiring to hear uh, the journey so far and yeah. uh, i should probably keep some of my old credit cards that I got. <laughs> sure. so now I'm, I'm curious right like what was that change like when you went from being the star player to leading team members right like that's a that's not an easy transition going from the wrestler to the wrestling coach yeah right so what was that kind of like i remember in the second company that was when you brought on 25 agents in like yeah. a two-year period yeah. opposed to a 10-year period yeah um what was that kind of like being a leader now instead of being a producer well i'd already kind of learned a lot of leadership because i was recruiting people at my first company i yeah. just wasn't making money i didn't have mm -hmm. a good track record mm -hmm. um what i think leadership is all about is track record okay um so i built the track record here you know and as we were building exterior I didn't just tell people what to do. I showed them what to do. Um, okay. And I think that's the kind of leader I would want to follow. You know, mm. the reason Doug Cox, uh, you know, one of my wrestling coaches, why I would listen to him, because he was a two-time Olympian. Yeah. Why wouldn't I listen to this guy? Yeah. So now that my wife and I started having success, you know, we bought the nice home and cars and this and that. It's like, we've had the, the success in our marriage and our business. It's like, now we can be an example to people. Right. Okay. I think some people try to lead too fast okay. and they try to control people or tell them you ought to do this, you ought to do that. And it's like, well, listen, buddy, you got to do it yourself first. Right. You got to lead from the front. And yeah. that's that to me is what what leadership is all about is showing people what to do, not just telling them. Wow. So if you had a new agent that joined your team today. Right. And they're like, you know, Jamie, how do I get this first client? Mm -hmm. right what's the what's the play give us a little well, bit of, give us a little bit of sauce man i'm getting in the yeah. ring right now i'm not I'm trying not to get punched in the face yeah yeah well first of all i wouldn't be the one to do that um okay. i'm very distant from from newer people because we've got a lot of great mentors managers people in place that would do nice. that so i would find a good agent uh, okay. a, a good upline so to speak a good okay. uh, leader for them to work with uh, yeah. but what i would say is um you know it's not so much how do you do it it's why why do you want to do it? And I'd, I'd get into like, what is it that you really want to achieve in this business, right? Mm -hmm. is, are you doing this because you just want to pay your bills? Because um, you could pay your bills working at McDonald's or, you know, working in a factory. Or are you building this business because you want to do something bigger? What, wow. what, what dreams do you have? Because I think if you figure out why someone wants to do it, they'll figure out the how. And yeah. obviously we're going to guide them and we have back office training, tutorials, videos, scripts, all this kind of stuff. We mm -hmm. got all that. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if you don't know why you want something, you're not going to go through all the work and study yeah. and train and learn anyways. Wow. Um, also, I would explain to you if you're new coming in, don't look at this as a job. You're not going to get paid to learn the business. You get paid once you know the business, just mm -hmm. like school, right? Mm -hmm. You're not going to get paid to learn how to be a doctor. You get paid once you got your bloody degree and you go be a doctor, right? Yeah. Same thing over here. Now you can make a little bit of money as you're growing and learning the business and stuff, but at the same time, you got to look at this as a career um, that you've got to invest in. You got to become a student of. Wow. So you, you talk a lot about the reason why you do things, 
And I'm curious to learn more about your reasons for doing this, right? Like you don't, yeah. what it, when we talked originally, it was 3,800. Now we're talking about 4,300 licensed agents. Yeah. Dude, like, that doesn't happen by accident, no. number one, no. right? Like you have to want that. Yeah. And that not even necessarily wanting that, but wanting that as a reason to get to something. Yeah. You know, and I'm curious what, what types of things drive you, right? Like yeah. you could easily hang up, hang up the gloves and yeah. say, you know what? I'm done. Yeah. I'm done wrestling. Yeah. I'm done fighting. Yeah. I'm relaxing. I'll yeah. see you guys when it's warm out. Well, this is, this is the crazy thing is I only stopped wrestling because it was no longer realistic that I could be number one. Okay. Right. That's why I stopped. That was mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. No other reason. Mm-hmm. By the way, speaking of wrestling, I've now got a couple of our young kids um, that are in wrestling and okay. it's just so cool. I love it. I it must mean, be nice to watch. Oh my yeah. God. I get butterfly. I love it. I, I just sit there and I just, int- I'm watching, I'm watching the, the coach. Actually, he's a guy that I wrestle with in high school is the coach of this gym in Guelph. No. It's really cool. Tom Keiko. Uh, he's got an amazing gym and uh, I'm watching him teach the, um, he was teaching the cross face the other night and then he's teaching um, half Nelson and for those that are wrestlers or if you've ever wrestled before, these are like the most basic of basic moves. Like I don't even like I was a I was like a child when I learned these things and it was just cool reminiscing and looking back on it. Anyway, yeah. it was just really cool. Um, your question, what what drives me? Yeah. Um, a couple things. Uh, number one, I want to be the best version of myself. Okay. Um, I don't want to just get through life and go, man, I could have done so much more. Why didn't I? give it my all Um, with balance too. Right. I mean, it's not like everything's business. It's like, I want to be a great father. I want to be a great husband Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I fail every day. We all fail every day, but let's fail forward. You know, Mm -hmm. as John Maxwell's book would say. Mm -hmm. Um, So I just want to become the best Jamie Prickett I can. Okay. I'm not trying to be like anyone else. I'm just trying to be the best with the tools that God gave me. Let's see how I can, you know, make myself awesome. You know, Um, and I think I'm doing okay at it because, well, no one else can do it better than me because I'm me. Right? There we go. Just like no one else can do you better than you. Yeah. Right? Um, but I think that so many people have more in the gas tank. Okay. Um, there was a study done of a pal- palliative nurse. Am I saying that word right? Palliative. Palliative pa- care. Palliative care nurse. Yeah. Um, they actually wrote a book, this nurse, and it was, you know, referencing people that were in a nursing home and that had lived most of their life out. And now they're in a nursing home, um, you know, kind of on knocking on death's door mm-hmm. and they they were asked you know if you had your life to live over again what would you do differently and many of them said i would one of the big common answers would i'd want to spend more time with my family mm-hmm. right um another uh common one was that if i had my life to live over again i would have taken more risks mm-hmm. right because a lot of times it's the risk that we don't take that we end up regretting yeah right i mean how many people in this nursing home could have bought a mcdonald's franchise for 1100 dollars us but all they could see was Ronald McDonald and, you know, a clown. Really? Ronald yeah. McDonald. Right. right? And probably thought. And then they're looking back. Oh, man. Um, but the number one thing that they said is they wish they could have left something behind or wow. could leave something behind that would be remembered long after they were gone. Wow. So one of my driving motivations isn't even in the here and now. Now, mm. in the here and now, I like to have fun. I want to watch people change their lives. And it's like the most inspiring thing in the world when I see other people win. Yeah. But one of my long term visions is and it's something that i won't even be here on earth to see is that my great 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 grandchildren one day will be sitting around the fire maybe at christmas time or something and one of my little great 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 grandbabies is going to look up to their papa and say hey papa who's that who's that guy up there with that funny looking ear and that bald guy and they'll be like oh that's your great 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 grandpa pricket and if it wasn't for him our family wouldn't have the ability to do what we're able to do to help others and to impact the world and stuff. So that's kind of where my head goes. Yeah. And has it always been that way or has it kind no, of evolved over it's time? It's evolved. Yeah, it's yeah. evolved. But time. that's where it is at this current moment. That's where it's right now. Yeah. Got it. Um, it evolved because, you know, when I was broke, busted, disgusted, it was one of my dreams. My biggest dream at the time when I like was very struggling, like struggling a lot financially for yeah. many, many years. Um, my dream was to be able to go to a restaurant and order from the from the left side of the menu. That was that was like a big dream of mine. Um, mm. And I wanted to be able to eat at a restaurant every single meal if I wanted to. And breakfast, lunch, dinner, yep. and dessert. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that was one of my dreams. Yeah. It's probably why I gained so much weight when we started experiencing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, hey man, um, you got to celebrate when you hit the milestones, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so that that was cool for me. Um, so that was still even not so much when we started Xperia, but when I left my first company, we started making money. My yeah. wife and I, we would eat out a lot and mm. nice restaurant. It didn't even have to be a nice. It could have been any restaurant. It was just the fact that I could just go and not have to worry about, you know what the, the right side of the menu was saying, which is the yeah. price, you know, that was a big thing. I mean, I remember 
and it's sometimes old habits die hard. Going with, you know, you got a bunch of kids and they all, can I get anyone to drink? And I'd be like, water, water yeah. for everyone. Yeah. We all, we all want water. Uh -huh. And, and sometimes I still catch myself doing that. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. I'm past that stage, but I still catch myself doing it. Mm -hmm. Now, now I'll justify it after. I'm like, guys, water's healthier. That's why, you know, yeah. it's better than the sugary pop. And it, isn't it crazy? Yeah. So like, I think finances drive so many of our decisions, mm -hmm. right? Like without even realizing. Yeah. And I've been, I've been exploring this idea of like, what are the, the habits that I've carried when I was in a previous financial position? till now that I still hold on to that I need to get rid of. Yeah. And it's it's funny almost how like our mind makes excuses um, for wanting certain things yeah. when really like that's our pocket that wants that. Yeah. You know, like for example, like I, my partner and I were having a conversation about like, oh, where do we want to live? Yeah. And we're like, oh, well, we can kind of see ourselves living here. I'm like, no, 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 no. That's, that's not us actually wanting that. That's us thinking, okay, what can we afford right now? But right. what about where I want to go? What can that me afford? Yeah. And you know, what type of experiences does that me desire yeah. and crave? And it is, it's a cool thought experiment to go through. And I know I'm not there yet, but it's, it's cool watching things change slowly, but surely. Yeah. So I appreciate you sharing yeah. now 44 now. Yeah. I don't mean to date you, yeah. but um, like what types of things are you looking forward to these days what's what's life at 44 like i was just telling you kind of like what i'm seeing now at 31 i'm curious yeah. if you could share some wisdom with the, you know the younger cats in the ring yeah, right yeah, now yeah, what's yeah. like life at 44 what are some of the cool things uh family wise financial wise goals wise mental health uh, physical spiritual yeah. you know experiences like where's your head at when you think about well, those things you know it's funny at the start of this year um our third oldest child was moving out of the house sorry our second wow. oldest child was moving out of the house our our oldest two are already out on their own congrats um, and then our you got them off the conveyor belt Great yeah, yeah yeah <laughs> and then uh but the 20 he's 21 uh, he's 22 now he was moving out of the house now with his girlfriend got so it. now we we're only gonna have one child left which wow. is mine and leanne's biological child mm -hmm. i have two from my first marriage she has one from her first marriage okay and then we have takia our daughter who's 12. okay and takia is now going to be an only child in the house for the first time Wow. Right? And this was back uh, when my last son moved out was April last year. Well, at the start of the year, Takia, our daughter, who's 12, knows that Addison, our oldest son, is moving out. Mm -hmm. She goes, um, remember you guys talked about adopting children, mm. mom and dad? And we're like, yeah, we did. And we did several years prior. Yeah, uh, We were actually going to adopt probably seven, eight years maybe nine years ago, wow. but then our son got extremely ill. Mm. Our older son that just recently moved out, um, he got sick, he had kidney failure and uh, had complications wow. and everything, he ended up with a transplant. So it all just kind of didn't work out at that time. Um, anyway, fast forward, here we are at the start of last year. So about 12 months ago and our daughter saying, you know, didn't you guys want to adopt? Well, you know, maybe we should look at that. And then all of a sudden my wife and I just went down the rabbit hole and we looked it all up and just did research on it, watched movies on it, videos, audios. I mean, we dove into it. We learned about the foster program, how that might be the best suiting program for us for fostering to adopt because there's a lot of children that foster out of the system. Yeah. And then at 18, they have nowhere to go. And we're like, oh my gosh, like, and, and that's kind of a sad situation. Yeah. And we were too old to be considered most likely for like a newborn adoption because okay. they typically would want a younger family. They'd also want a younger couple maybe that doesn't already have children, right? Mm. That's typically who someone's going to want to give their baby up for adoption if they're not in a place to take care of their child. Yeah. So we thought, well, let's look at the fostering system, which is kind of dangerous from a, a heart standpoint because yeah. you could foster a child for, for a year and then all of a sudden they're not in your care anymore because mm. th the idea of fostering is that the, the parents, biological parents, are going to be able to have the children come back into their care. Okay. Well, we ended up uh, saying that we're willing to foster two or more children. We, we wanted minimum two um, because we knew that a lot of times siblings can get separated in the foster system. Wow. And we wanted two or more. Well, we got a call while we were on a trip in Mexico with our company, uh, with a hundred of our agents. We got a call and the call was, we just got your final approval for the fostering because we had to do all these police checks and checks of every city we've lived in, child welfare checks, all that stuff for our existing children. And then uh, we got the call in the morning that, hey, you're approved, everything's good. And we're like, oh, cool. Well, yeah. we're coming home in a couple of days. A couple hours later, we get a call. There's four children that just went into foster today. Wow. They need a place by tomorrow. Otherwise, they're going to get separated Two go to one place, two go to another place because wow. we don't have anyone that can take four. Okay. Will you guys take them? But yeah, let's book a flight. So my wife booked a flight. No came way. Back the next day. Um, and all four of the children have been with us now for 10 months. That's magical. And their oldest sibling who is in another home 
also just got out of that home. She was in the home longer and wow. uh, is now with us. So we got five new additions to the family, Congrats. which is awesome. And it's looking very promising for us to be a long-term permanent family. Um, we can never say for sure, but in six months uh, from the recording of this, uh, we'll know wow. more well, firm answers. So. Amen. Well, I hope it I hope it works out in your favor. But you yeah, to, to answer your question, um, I know I'm going off path here. That's okay. Um, the goal, it's your show. It's yeah. <laughs> the, the goals kind of yeah. change from like, you know, at one point we were kind of like, man, our kids are like older now. We got this freedom. It's crazy. Like yeah. we literally last year before the children uh, came into our lives, we already taken three vacations for a week each time with mm. Takia because mm. she's 12 and the other ones are older and stuff and they don't want to be around mom and dad half the time anyway. Yeah. So we we're just <laughs> traveling, be able to do whatever we want. Our daughter's in a private school. So you always catch up, do the work on the side. And, and now it's like, well, we lost that freedom to travel anytime we want. Yeah. Um, that said, we are working on getting their passports and we're very close to it. We're going to take a big family vacation. That's but, awesome. But, um, you know, for us, it's, um, I don't know. It's like, what, 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 what good is your life if you're not giving back or helping others? Like, wow. it's just a waste, I think. Wow. Kind of. Yeah, that's, man. That's it's... where I'm, that's where I think. I think that's what's changed for me from my 30s to my 40s, maybe, is that now it's like I care more about other people than I ever did before. I always cared about other people, but yeah. now like I really do, you know, mm -hmm. like, like I don't, I don't just say it cause it sounds pretty. It's like, I genuinely want to see people live a good life. Right. Unless yeah. they're jerks, then screw you. But, you, know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a client of mine, uh, shared a, a book and kind of like a lesson, uh, called the second mountain. She goes, you know, I don't, I don't really need anything. You know, at this point, I've, I've got all the things that I want in my life. I just want to help others. Yeah. And, you know, this is kind of like the second mountain that I'm on. You know, that first mountain is like personal success. And once you hit that, then you're like, now what? Yeah. And, you know, she she shares it's a, it's a similar kind of desire yeah, for her cool. at this point as well, you yeah. know, is to give back and and yeah. share with the next generation and the people that are coming up and, yeah. and make life a better place for yeah. others. Yeah. So it, it, I appreciate you sharing. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm 44 years young. Um, yeah. I got a lot of other personal goals, too. I mean, like I want to do some like I want I don't have a private jet yet. You know, mm. I don't have a butler yet. You know, like there's some things I want to get done over here. Yeah. But it's like it's so secondary to changing lives. Yeah. But by changing lives, it's it's enriching our lives as well. 100%. 100%. So do you remember the first time you made 100 grand in a month? I don't. Um, and I have probably for the last several years um, done that. But I do remember it. I remember when you asked me this when we were on the phone. Mm -hmm. I do remember the first time someone in our business made 100 grand in a month. All right, you got to tell us about it. And that was emotional. That was January last year. Congrats. Um, first time a guy in our business, Moro Arturi, made it six figures in a month. Um, and it was like, this is a guy that he was, he actually was at the same company I came from where I struggled. He was there for 19 years. Okay. Okay. Moro's, I think, 55 years old. I hope okay. I'm not dating him. Okay. Uh, but he was there for 19 years and his best year, 100,000 in a year. No, no, I don't believe you. In a year. Wow. Um, after seven years with Xperia. Wow. Made his first six figures in a month. With wow. Us. And I can't tell you how proud I am of him and, and just... You know, for him to leave that company, first of all, because he was making a comfortable six figures, like he didn't have to work that hard for it anymore because he built the team, had about 40 agents, okay. still had some clients he serviced. Um, but so it was uncomfortable for him to start yeah. over again. He was already almost 50 when he mm -hmm. joined us. I think mm -hmm. he was 48 years old uh, when he joined us. So, you know, it was a risk for him. And we were a brand new company. We were only three years old when he joined Ooh, wow. us. Right. So it wasn't like we had this 10 year track record and all these mm -hmm. people having success. We didn't have any people having big success at this point when he yeah. joined us. So, you know, he always jokes with me and it, he'll call me once in a while and he'll say, Jamie, this thing might work. You know, and he always says that, Jamie, this thing might work. <laughs> I'm like, well, if it does, man, we're in for a real ride. <laughs> wow. So what, what was one of the biggest lessons after teaching leaders to become better leaders uh, that you realized? You know, like you I, so like you, you went from being the being the top performer, right? In whatever realm it was that you wanted. Now you, you've got 4,300 agents. 42. Yeah. 42. Well, by the time this you'll that's probably true. have over 5,000. That's right. That that's point. true. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so like what types of things have you learned as your role has changed, right? From the person doing the thing yeah. to the person leading a team doing the thing. Now the person setting the broader vision yeah. and having a bunch of people execute, you know, how's your, what are some of those lessons that come to mind? Yeah. Um, S yeah. Something I wish I knew 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I wish I recognized earlier in my journey 
that not everybody wants what I want because I used to alienate, not alienate people, but I wouldn't, I don't even want to say I wouldn't treat them the same. I wouldn't treat them bad, but I would kind of question them and be like, and you know, it comes across, right? If someone didn't want to make a million dollars a year, I was like, why not? Why wouldn't you want to? Are you crazy? Yeah. But now I realize what it takes to make a million dollars a year. You have to mm -hmm. sacrifice a lot. I mean, there was a lot of sacrifices that went into us building an empire, mm -hmm. right? And not everyone wants to do that. And mm -hmm. God bless them. They don't want to do that. Go make 50,000 a year if that makes you happy. Go make 100,000 a year if that makes you happy. You don't have to want what I want. And I used to always think that people were weak or they weren't tough or, you know, you just, you know, you, you just, you don't know what your why is. Well, some people's why is to have a white picket fence, have 1.3 kids and live a comfortable life and be home and be at all the sporting events and yeah. not have to stress on the weekend and be able to go into a job at nine o'clock and plug out at five o'clock and never think again about their job. And, and you know, when I was struggling at my former company, I, I kind of forgot this as we started building Xperia that I too once dreamt of what would it be like if I could just be normal? Mm. Like here I am driving home late from an appointment at 11 o'clock at night, tears in my eyes because the sale didn't go down. I'm mm -hmm. missing my rent payment mm -hmm. and I got tears in my eyes. I remember one time looking in the rear view mirror at myself with tears in my eyes saying, why are you doing this? Why don't you just go get a job? Like I was doing my apprenticeship as a machinist. I could have been making 80,000, 90,000 a year as a machinist by now. I'm Instead, I'm out every single night killing myself trying to build a business. And now this was my former company where it was a lot more difficult. We've, we've yeah. really given people a hand up over here. It's still tough, but not quite as mm -hmm. bad as what I had to endure, I think. Mm -hmm. um, you know, even I wanted to go back to just live a normal life. But for some reason, I was just wired that, no, you got to do this. You got to be bigger, think bigger, all this. And it was like almost driving me crazy. It's like, why can't I be normal? Mm. You know, and I think maybe some people watching your show and the type of people that that like this type of content, you know, the David Goggins type content. Yeah. The, the, Get hard. Yeah. You know, these these uh, Ed, uh, what's that? My let. Ed, my let the uh, I'm thinking of that. Uh, the black preacher guy. Uh, what's his name? Someone showed me him. The, the other guy day. where someone's holding his head underwater and, you, you know, what you want to do more than anything else when someone's holding you your head underwater. Breathe. You want to want to breathe. breathe yeah. right? Or something like that. that. Eric Thomas. Okay. That's it. Yeah, E.T. Um, that's it. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you hear these guys and it's like some people like that stuff and other mm -hmm. people are like hogwash. I don't, man, I just want to watch TV and see what's yeah. on, see who's going to win Survivor yeah. this what, year. What beer do you drink? Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but I don't judge people like that mm -hmm. at all anymore. It's mm -hmm. like that's everyone is wired different. Right. Yeah. Some people are just wired different and it doesn't make them good. Doesn't make them bad. Doesn't make me good. Doesn't make me bad. Just mm -hmm. makes me different. So yeah. I wish I recognized that earlier on in leading people uh, because I think that I can lead people mm -hmm. that are the mentality of, you know, I just want to have a comfortable lifestyle. I can lead those people now mm. because I can help them have a comfortable lifestyle. I can also lead the people that are batshit crazy like Eric Thomas and ready to go and want to just tear up the world. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, it was funny. So I was having a car, my little cousin, right? He's 28. Yeah. Turning 29 this year. And he just bought a 28 unit rooming house. Wow. That's been boarded up and he's going to convert it into a hotel. We're doing the marketing and the design and stuff like that for the hotel. And him and I were driving the other day. Someone inspired me to turn it into a TV show. So I'm like, fuck it, let's shoot a TV show. So I was over there and we're filming this, this show and we're in between kind of like uh, sets, right? And we're just driving, talking. And we're talking about a, a mutual friend. And he was like, man, like, you know, I realized recently that like him and I just don't want the same things. And you see that lady right there who's on break at McDonald's smoking her cigarette? This is a little old lady, right? Yeah. And he's like, that might be all she has envisioned for her life and that's success. Yeah. And that was something that I had to learn, you know, like she goes home and she either has her house paid off, she's paying her mortgage, she pays her rent. And what she makes at McDonald's working part time is probably enough for her. Yep. That's all she wants. Yep. She just wants her little cats that she feeds the cats. She goes home, she watches her soap opera and yep. she goes back to work the next day. And that's the vision that she has for her life. And that's OK. Yep. And, you know, like it was a, it was a powerful lesson that I'm still realizing, too, because I'm like, what do you mean? You don't you don't want to kill like yeah. obviously not kill, but like yeah, yeah. <laughs> you, you don't want to burn everything down. You don't want to uh, build this thing as big as you can. Like yeah. you don't want to want the best version. Well, maybe that is the best version of, yeah. of you. But yeah. to me, like my vision of best version might be a little bit different than someone else's, yeah. you know, and like my girl might look at me weird sometimes. It's like you've been working since 5 a.m. this morning and it's like 11 p.m. Like and yeah. you, you've barely gone to the washroom like 
Yeah. Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm great. I'm fired up right now. And she's, yeah. and she's like, I'm tired. I'm going to bed. I'm like, okay, I'll see you in the morning. Yeah. You know, and like, I'm like ready to go. Right. Yeah. And it's, it's recognizing that not every, I'm just kind of realizing that now that people want different things. Yeah. And, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing that because to me, it's like, wait, you, you don't want this? Like, yeah. why not? But, I, you know, this, and this is part of, I guess, growing up, like, you know, like, and learning yeah. that everybody wants different things. So I, sure. I appreciate it. And yeah. it's it's kind of cool to hear that there's other crazy people out there. Oh, yeah. Or maybe normal, who knows? <laughs> yep. yep. I was just talking to someone from Texas, this nice lady. Yeah. Um, and uh, she's in our business, in our industry. Mm-hmm. And uh, she knows a lot of the big players and stuff. And when mm-hmm. I was talking to her, I said something like, I said, now listen, I, you might think I'm crazy the way I'm talking. She goes, listen, Jamie, if I didn't think you were crazy, I wouldn't be here talking to you right now. 100%. Some people like that. They like the crazy, like, how big can we make this, right? Yeah. And stuff they buy into that vision and that's the thing it's like i just want to be the best version i want to see how much more like i've, I've got more in the tank like why not use yeah. it right and, and i realized the other day that like i'm gonna get more energy tomorrow like i may as well just use it all today yeah like there's no point in trying to save yeah. any energy it doesn't make sense right yeah. i'm just gonna go eat a meal i'm gonna go to sleep and then i wake up tomorrow fired up again and go do it again yeah so it's it's pretty cool to hear that there's other people with you know cooler glasses and stuff that that feels similarly <laughs> so what's it been like building an organization with 4300 people like how do you keep the culture you know it i guess cold and and what's the word that i'm looking for like how do you curate a culture that keeps 4300 people wanting to actually be a part of i think just transparency you know really about what your goals are and and what you believe they can achieve like um the one one common theme that goes through our company and a lot of people say this as they get around us and they've been with other companies before is our culture is unique and the biggest thing that one of the most common things that we hear and i hear from people about other leaders in our company is the transparency Mm. they're like you just know what you're going to get from jamie Mm. you just know what you're going to get from frank you just know what you're going to get from baljeet like like we don't hold back like we're not and i think a lot of that it might be top down maybe people see me doing it they see me cussing, burping, farting, and they, they're they like, man, if the CEO can do it, I can do it. Why can't I just be who I am and not worry about people judging me? And mm-hmm. some people might not like that. You know, I know some people are like, oh, geez, Jamie's going off again. Here he goes, right? Mm-hmm. And and But at the same time, they'll like, I put a post on Facebook that was very controversial a couple of weeks ago, and it was about one of our competitors, and I just slapped them in the face because I'm tired of this one competitor in particular lying about us, okay. right? And that's what they do. They lie. So on my post, I said, hey, does anyone know who this guy is? And I knew damn well who he is. He's the biggest guy in Canada in the industry. Okay. And I said, does anyone know who this guy is? Because I'm tired of him either lying or ignorant and doesn't understand how our industry actually works. Mm-hmm. It's one of the two. Oh my gosh, he had all of his fan club jumping on my post like, oh, you don't know nothing. He's like our God. They didn't say that, but yeah. they might as well have like, oh, yeah. you don't know. That's this what you heard. Like, oh yeah, I mean, that's basically what they're saying. And, yeah. and then I had guys from our side saying, oh, you know, Jamie speaking the truth, yeah. brother. Da, 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 da. And I had someone actually say to me, and I ended up doing a video follow-up to it the next day. I did a okay. Facebook Live and it kind of cleared up everything of why I did that and what okay. the facts were and everything. Yeah. And it was kind of like everyone had like this moment of like, wow, Jamie, you freaking hit the nail on the head. We Mm got to speak the truth when people are bullshitting who we are, right? So anyway, talking to one of our top leaders, Darren, and uh, he's got over, I think he's got 1,400 agents in his business alone with us. And uh, Darren says, Jamie, I got to admit, I was scared when I saw that post, when you posted a picture of the guy saying, does anyone know this idiot kind of thing? That's funny. He goes, but then how you handle it the next day on a Facebook Live, he goes, dude, that's what we got to do. Right. Yeah. So it's sometimes being, not being afraid of taking a bit of a risk. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you don't, I mean, if you're not in our industry and that sounds weird to you, what, what risk was that? You know, I post whatever I want on Facebook. Well, when you got 4,200 agents yeah. in your business, you got to be careful. I can't just 100%. post, you know, my opinion on, you know, whatever topic, you yeah, know, dude, you got I could alienate look, people. Right. Yep. You got people that look up to you. You got yeah. MGAs that are relying on you to, you know, transparently distribute yep. whatever products it is yep. that they're selling. So like, there's it. a lot of things like, that you have to lose. Yep. Right. So yep. I, I definitely commend you getting into the battle with your spear and shield well, and say, well, the, fun, go. The, the funny part was in this company is the largest MJ in all of Canada. We're about number six right now. Okay. They're the biggest. And okay. that's who I was picking on as their biggest guy because he's lying about us. And doesn't their CEO, no, their president call mm-hmm. me. Mm. on my cell phone that same day and no says way. jamie what's going on man because i actually met him at one of these industry conferences before and i said yeah. listen I said your boy's lying about me i said i'm tired of him lying so I'm, oh what did he say and i said don't worry it's nothing compliance related yeah you know we had a good chat he was he's actually a really nice guy they're they're president but 
again, he's just a corporate guy. He's not, he's, he didn't start the company. He's yeah. more like the corporate president guy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, wow. So that number one spot, I mean, I guess it's only a matter of time, right? It's just a matter of time. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a matter of time. So what do you think makes Xperia different than, so like, let's say you're talking to like an agent, which probably, I don't know how much you do of these days yeah. versus Quite a bit. I, really. Oh, okay. I do a lot. Usually it's four other people in the team. Like I'm helping okay. them talk to agent. I was talking to a guy this morning before I got here. Oh, no um, so uh, what makes us different? Uh, yeah. Number one, we don't freaking lie. Hmm. I hate our industry. I hate so many companies out there because they lie. They lie about themselves and they lie about others. Mm. I don't get it. Mm. I don't know why people have to lie to get ahead. Mm. This industry is probably the most corrupt industry I could ever imagine. I don't think there's more lies that go on in any other industry than this industry. It's borderline corrupt. Wow. Um, we don't lie. Wow. We just tell you like it is. Mm. If we're not the best in one area, we'll tell you. If we're the best in one area, we'll damn sure tell you as well. But we're not going to lie. We're not going to exaggerate, make up things. So mm. that makes us different, I think. Um, but the nuts and bolts of it is, um, you know, we have a more competitive comp plan for someone that wants to build an agency. Mm. Um, there's no one out there that can touch us right now. Uh, mm -hmm. we've, we've built a very competitive model. Um, part of the reason we're able to do that is because my wife and I are a part of the sales force still. Yeah. Right. We're not just corporate execs taking a million plus salary from the corp. No, we're, we're building it from the inside, mm. right? So um, we are, we're also not owned by anyone. We haven't sold out, right? We've had four companies that wanted to buy us and we could have walked out multi-deca millionaires overnight, like just a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, one, one valuation three years ago was at 50 million. I mean, we could have checked out and, and now we're at least double that. And we could check out, but that's not what we're here for. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that doesn't change lives by us checking out. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think that people see that. They see the transparency and they see the comp that, yeah. that we're better. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know. Probably the product offering as well. Yeah, and ownership. I mean, there's a bunch of things that maybe your viewers w it wouldn't make any sense to because they're not in the industry. But I've got a lot of friends that are in insurance, right? Yep. And they're like, no, my company's best. And I'm like, okay, why? Like, yeah, like my comp plan's sick. And I'm like, oh, okay. Yeah, great. and they might <laughs> and they might say that. And um, yeah. the only problem is if they're not with Xperia, they're wrong. Um, <laughs> and that's okay. You have the right, right yeah. to remain wrong. Yeah. Um, because I was with a company for mm -hmm. 10 years, bro. Yeah. And for 10 years, I told everybody. This is the best. This is God's gift to humanity. This is the best comp plan. This is the best company in the industry. Nothing's better. And mm -hmm. guess what? I didn't know how another single company's comp plan worked. Mm. I had no idea. Mm -hmm. I just said what I was told okay. by my upline. And yeah. they were told by their upline and their leader and their mentor and their coach. Guess what? When we started Xperia, I dissected every freaking company in the country. I know mm. how they all work. Mm. I can tell you within three minutes, if you sit down with me with someone from a company, I could tell you in three minutes how their comp plan is, probably within a couple percentage points of what they're earning. I know them. I know the world. I know mm -hmm. what world I'm in right now. Mm -hmm. When we went to the US, it took us two years before we recruited our first licensed agent. Mm -hmm. Now we've got almost 1,700 licensed agents in the US. But it took us two years to get our first one. Two years later, 1,700. Wow. Why did it take us two years? Because I was studying every single company. And I don't get me wrong, it wasn't like we're not recruiting. It's just we we're putting putting feelers out there and stuff. Yeah. And we weren't really, you know, actively doing it. It was mm -hmm. right when the pandemic hit is when we launched. So mm -hmm. bad timing there. Mm -hmm. Turned out to be good timing because we can do a lot of things on, on Zoom. Yeah. Um, but at the time we really were just trying to keep everything going in Canada because yeah. you know that scared a lot of people when the pandemic hit, right? Um, but I'll tell you, it's like I studied the competitors mm. because I wanted to make sure that when we built our comp plan in the US, that it was much like we did in Canada, mm. where we were going to be the best. Mm -hmm. And no matter what other cat comes along, mm -hmm. we're going to beat them. And right now, there's actually another big cat that just started in October last year in the US. Nice. We crush them. Yeah. Now, yes. they're recruiting a lot of people because they have influence. This is a guy that broke off from another big entity starting his own deal. Yeah. And when I look at their comp plan, I'm like, anyone that's logical is going to pick us. Yeah. Well, so. hey, man, like somebody's got to keep it interesting, right? Yeah. Like you can't just you can't just dominate the whole competition, no, right? You got to no. give them a chance. Come on. No, Jamie. listen, I'll, I'll be sat I'll be <laughs> satisfied when we have half of all the licensed agents in North America with Xperia. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. look, we'll check in again when you have half and we'll see yeah. what satisfies you then. That's right. Because That's right. then it I'm, needs to be a bigger percentage. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> man, this is this has been a, a real a real pleasure. So I'm curious, you haven't crossed 100K in a day just yet. No. But what do you think it's going to take to get there? Um. I'm, it's not a focus of mine. Yeah. Honestly, um, I just think it'll happen when it happens. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a focus of mine. 
you know, we're not trying to figure out where our next paycheck comes out anymore. Yeah. It comes from anymore. So. When did that change? And how did that change your mind? Because Honestly, that changed. Um, that changed originally when I left my first company. Yeah. All of a sudden we started making 25 grand a month. That, that was more money than we'd ever made before. Wow. So that that's when it changed for me about 12 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but then we started Xperior and for five years we had to, you know, build this company up and I had to produce um, my wife and I working like dogs to make this thing happen. Mm -hmm. um, the only time that we ever struggled financially with Xperior mm -hmm. was probably our first year um, you know, getting things going, opened up our first head office, ha hired our first staff. That was a struggle. Yeah. Um, and then three years later, we got sued by my former company. Is that your first time getting sued? That was first and only time getting congrats. sued. Congrats. I yeah. think I, yeah. I hear there's a stat like you got to get sued in order to really yeah. make it. So yeah. Congrats so we got it. sued because they claimed that I was sharing trade secrets. Mm. But I said to the lawyers at the table, downtown Toronto, I said, it's not a secret. Y'all suck. Hmm. I'm just exposing it, you know, I, so they didn't like that. Um, so we ended up getting sued and uh, end up costing us most of more legal fees than anything. Hmm. Uh, but yeah, it cost us several hundred thousand and Damn. we didn't have that kind of money then. And we struggled. We ended up selling a rental property and our cottage during that time wow. just to be safe, wow. like just to make sure the company stayed afloat. And that was our third year in the business. After that lawsuit was settled, it's been Smooth sale. I mean, there's ups and downs, but from a financial standpoint, my wife and I have never had to look at our bank account in seven years. Um, you know, so that's been cool. Um, yeah. And now we have people doing it, right? So yeah. that's, that's that's what I think is just more amazing than anything. Yeah. So I want to. So if you were to restart, let's say everything were to get taken away from Jamie, you know, and you and you had to start day one, what do you think your your actions would be? So if I'm 44 years old and had to start over from day one, yeah, God is my witness. I would try and find another person that started Xperior yeah. and join them. Okay. I wouldn't want to do it again. Mm. Uh, we went through hell and back. Uh, we sacrificed so much. Um, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Mm. I talked to some leaders that say, oh yeah, I'm going to leave my company. I'm going to start my own. I'm like, bro, you're 50. Good luck. Yeah. I was 34, 30, 34 years old when we started this company mm -hmm. and I had a lot of energy. I still have a lot of energy, mm. but not like I did when I was 34. Mm. I mean, I'm telling you, this thing took everything yeah. out of us. So if I could, if I had to start over again, I wouldn't, mm. I would join someone else who already built it and I would mm. become a part of their team. Yeah. And I'd just try and be the biggest guy on their team. So I wouldn't have to worry about all the head office administrative crap. Um, but um, if I was 34 again, yeah, and there was no Xperior or company like ours out there and I had to start it over again, the only thing I would have done different is I wouldn't have burnt bridges with people. Mm. Um, I burnt some bridges and uh, sometimes I would justify it that they were assholes, so who cares? But have I ever been an asshole? Sure, right? Um, so I wouldn't have burnt bridges with people. I think I, I, think I, um, I had a bit of a temper. I was younger, more Ah, like someone pissed me off. I let them know right on the spot instead of giving it. Yeah. Right. Ready like fight. like I, I wouldn't physically fight them, but mentally I'd be like, I, I just go at them with words. And it's mm -hmm. like, now I look back and go, why couldn't I just kept my mouth shut there? Mm. Why couldn't I just given it 24 hours before I replied to that email? You know what I mean? I used to be really quick on the trigger um, and get really, you know, matter of fact, some of our leaders that have been with me now for eight years, nine years, 10 years, they'll tell you, Jamie Prickett is not the same guy he was eight years ago, seven years ago. They said, we used to be afraid to come to you with concerns because I would snap at them if I didn't agree with them. Now, sometimes I want to snap at them, but I'll just be like, Jamie, sing a lullaby song in your brain, breathe. calm yourself, breathe. They don't mean that they don't understand how they said that. Yeah. And then I'll come back to them. Hey, you know what? That's, that's a, I like, that's an interesting observation. Do you mind <laughs> if, mind if I get back to you on that? And I'll wait until I'm in a clear space, clear mind. And then sometimes, guess what? Their idea was amazing. I just didn't look at it from different angles. And that's mm. one of the biggest improvements that I've made. So if I could wow. go back in time and start the company, I would learn to shut up okay. and listen a bit more. Um, hmm. You know, be, be less confrontational. That's people. sound advice, man. I really appreciate it. You got it, man. So before we do rock out of here, I'm curious. Like, I know you wrote your own book. And, yeah. and I, wa I want you to share a little bit about that in a second. But what are some of the books that, you know, m make Jamie, Jamie? Um, coach, uh, coach is a book written by actually the founder of the company that I left. Huh. Um, 
he was no longer a part of that company when I joined it. He was long gone, sold it many years prior. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a lot of respect for him. The guy's name's Art Williams and the book is called Coach. I absolutely love the book. It does pertain to our industry, but some of the stories and the stuff that they went through, um, I remember I, I never really had depression in my life other than maybe a two week period where I was just down and out and I was making money. It wasn't like a financial, you know, I'm stressed out because of money. I just felt like down and I didn't know what it was and I couldn't kick it. Even my wife came home, uh, you know, coming home from the office, she goes, are you okay? And I'm like, I don't know. And I just sat there and I just didn't want to move. And I'd never felt like this before in my life. Wow. And, uh, you know, I tried reading the Bible and tried all these other things. And then and I just didn't know what it was. And I'm like, man, I don't know. Like I wasn't at the point where I was suicidal, but I just felt like, what am I doing? And yeah. uh, I ended up picking up the book Coach for the second time. I'd already read it. Okay. And I'm like, I'm going to read Coach because this is while we were just starting to get our business going, right? And I read Coach and as I was reading the stories about Art Williams and all the struggles that they went through, it just made me realize this is how it's supposed to go. Mm. I'm supposed to have these problems. I'm supposed to have people quitting on me. I'm supposed to have people talking bad about me, saying I'm crazy. Because mm. Art, look at Art, he's like the godfather of this this world that I'm in. And he went through it all. And that that really helped me get out of a funk. So that book was huge. Um, another one was uh, Failing Forward. I know that one's said by so many people, but I, I love John Maxwell's Failing Forward. Um, <clears throat> How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, was was That was a game changer for me at 22 years of age, by the way. Okay. Uh, 22 years of age, How to Win Friends and Influence People was the best thing. That I sounds like one read. of the ones that the wrestling coach might have given you. No, no. I was I was in the, in the financial business at that time. It okay. was actually... Uh, quick story on how that book came out. Yeah. <clears throat> my upline john he says to me one day he goes hey how'd those sales go this week i'm like everyone's stupid he's like what are you talking about i said i had five sales lined up every one of them should have bought and they're all freaking stupid and john goes really all five of them i said yeah they're all stupid and he goes what's the common denominator i said what that they're all stupid and he goes no you i was like huh what are you talking about 22 years old. I know what's up. You know, I know everything. I'm right? 22. And I'm, I'm, I'm like six, seven months in the yeah. business at this time. And he goes, Jamie, he goes, you might be the issue. I'm like, I don't know, man. Like I showed them it was better. And he goes, it might be how you're communicating with them. I said, wow, mm -hmm. I don't know. And, but I was open to listen to him. I respected him mm -hmm. at the time. Right. And he goes, I want you to read this book. And he gave me how to win friends and influence people. As I read that book, I was like, oh my God, this is why I read the book. And this was my epiphany. This is why I only had a handful of friends all through high school, but my brother was friends with the entire high school, was that book. My brother was a different kind of person than I was from a personality standpoint. I realized why I'd alienated so many people that I couldn't even be friends with because of how my attitude was and how I communicated with people. And I realized that in high school, and I did have like three best friends through high school. And to this day, we're still, two of them are still my best friends. Um, and one of them went AWOL and drugs and just, that don't even know what happened to them. I haven't talked to them in a decade and a half. Wow. But anyway, uh, two of them are still my best friends to this day. Um, but my brother was like all kinds of friends and a bunch of best friends, right? And wow. I realized after reading that book why. So, hmm. But I'll let your viewers read it for themselves and figure out. Yeah, that book's a game changer. Any, any others that come to mind? None that are popping out right now. That's okay. Um, yeah. So what about... What oh, about sorry. Um, here we go. Uh, sorry, the other one that absolutely comes to mind, and this is the one that helped me lose 45 pounds last year or the year before, I guess, a year and a half ago, um, is David Goggins' Can't Hurt Me. I love that book. Um, if you can't handle some foul language, you might not want to listen to it, mm -hmm. uh, but David Goggins is like, he's like my hero when it comes to fitness and discipline. Yeah. So. Now, you, 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 you wrote your own book. You make some of your own content these days. Yes. I'm curious as to some of the reasons why. So what made you want to write a book uh, in the first place? Um, a lady actually approached me on LinkedIn and said, hey, Jamie, um, I'm reaching out to CEOs that would like to write a book and I would help you ghostwrite it and you just tell me your stories. And, mm. and I messaged her back and said, so basically I get to talk and you're going to write everything? She's like, yep. Good I'm deal. Like, I'm in. So that's what I did. I just had to talk. Yeah. Um, now I had to read over it a few times, make sure it was my language, my words. Uh, we did. We put it on Audible as well. Okay. Um, and <clears throat> and it's a book that's, especially if you're in the insurance business. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it is hands down the best book in the history of the insurance business. I, yeah. I really do. Can't um, fall off the ground, right? Can't fall off the floor. Off the floor. Yeah. Um, and but what it is, it's a story where I've showcased 25 people that society would have deemed losers, hmm. and they became superstars in our business. 
Wow. But and I picked the people with the worst stories before Exterior, um, including gun violence with one, um, not them, but against them. Um, you know, including a guy that was homeless with us, now making over two hundred thousand a year. Um, he was living in the streets of Toronto for several years. Um, man, just some rags to riches stories, mm -hmm. um, and that's uh, really inspiring for those that maybe feel like, oh, I can't do it because of this or that. There's no excuse. Right. Yeah. There's there's almost no excuse. I mean, health reasons could be the reason, but mm -hmm. um, most people it's excuses. Now, what's Jamie's day like these days? Uh, I come to the office about nine o'clock um, and I'm here till usually four. And then at night, I'm usually on a conference call, maybe for an hour or two, depending on the evening. Um, Saturdays and Sundays is mostly family time now. Mm -hmm. It was never like that in the beginning. It was seven days a week grinding, given everything. Um, but in the office, it's basically Zooms all day, uh, emails the other half of the day. Um, that's it. I mean, I'm probably working 50 hours a week, I would say. Mm -hmm. Nothing crazy right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have nine children now, right? Um, by the way, one of them moved back in with us. Then five plus our 12-year-old plus the one that moved back in. So yeah, we got seven kids in the house. One of them's an adult. That's but, exciting. Yeah, we're busy, busy, yeah. busy house. We're in the middle of a renovation. Oof. Um, so we've got now three girls in one room. Um, my wife's office is now a bedroom. Um, I don't have an office at home anymore and we're changing it. We had four bedrooms on the main floor and we're doing an extension and over the garage. And anyway, it's gonna be a 10 bedroom on the main floor um, and everyone's gonna have their own bedroom, including our other children that moved out in case they ever wanna move back home. Dude, that's exciting. Let yeah. me know if you're if you're taking on any more fosters. Any more. <laughs> I'll, I will gladly sign up. Like I said earlier, I come with camera gear. Okay. You know, and maybe Lee as well. So, <laughs> but man, really, really appreciate oh. you uh, you sharing. So before before we rock out of here, if if actually one more question, okay, if everything were to disappear, right? Um, Experience gone, and all all Jamie Prickett has is one message that he could leave with grandkids, great grandkids, all those generations, you know, like I know we wanted to leave something behind and that was a big motivator, but let's say you could only leave one message. Okay, that's the only thing, like nothing financial, nothing that you built, nothing physical. All you could leave is one message. What message would you leave? Well, I think I thought of like 10 things as you were talking and asking the question. Okay, well, let's all 10 then. Yeah, um, it, you can do it. Okay. I think it's that would be the biggest one I, that keeps coming to my mind. You can do it. Mm. You know, I think mm. some people just doubt themselves. Um, you know, I have no business being in the seat that I'm in right now. I got no business. Mm. You know, I remember guidance. I don't know if they still have guidance counselors, but when I was in school, they had guidance counselors. Mm. And I remember the guidance counselors telling me that you're not going to be able to go to college with your grades. So have you ever thought of, you know, what type of factory you'd like to work or maybe you can pick up a trade? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I, like I didn't care. I was. I'm a wrestler. You yeah, know. I'm going gonna be an Olympian. I'm going to be on the Cheerios. Right? I'm going to be on the Cheerios box. Yeah, yeah, what right. you mean? I mean, what <laughs> exactly? Exactly. Factory. You know. Cheerios. If it's not Cheerios, but nothing. I just think people learn differently. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, like Moro Arturi, this guy. He'll make a million this year. Um, he's a guy that made 100 grand in a month. He's yeah. done it a couple times now. Yeah. He'll be over a million this year. Um, this guy before he joined the insurance business was working in a paint store, in retail. Wow. You know, no post-secondary education. Um, Frank DeLeo, um, again, that guy's almost at a million now in income. Um, that guy was before Experior, was working at Costco as a forklift driver. Wow. You know, um, Darren Golka, I'm just naming a couple of our big guys. Okay. Darren Golka was in 18 different businesses and failed in 17 of them. The only one that actually worked for him was in the insurance business. And then he left that company and he's now with us. Wow. Um, but you know, 17 other failed businesses where he lost more money than he made, you know? What a so story. it's just, you can do it. Yeah. You can do it. There's, there's people with far worse accolades than you might have mm -hmm. that are doing it. hundred percent. Right? Well, so. Jamie, man, thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you so much for sharing the stories of others, uh, that have inspired you and will hopefully inspire the next generation. So once again, I'm Javon. Oh, before we even do that, let us know where. Uh, we can follow you that camera that camera yeah sure um you can follow me at uh, jamie prickett uh on facebook uh instagram i don't really use instagram but our team's always puts in, putting stuff 
So a lot of stuff you'll see on Instagram isn't me, it's our team that does it. Uh, but my personal Facebook page, I have a business Facebook page, just my name, Jamie Prickett. Um, and uh, if you're interested in, in reading that book to learn about some of the success stories that, that we've been able to create with our model, um, it's called Can't Fall Off the Floor. And uh, you can find that on Amazon or wherever you buy your books. Beautiful, Jamie, thank you so much. Once again, that's another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K. And that's Jamie Prickett's way of making 100 grand in a month. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your host, Javon.ca, and I'll see you on the next episode. Peace.